Hello all you lovely tea breakers. I am Mike Senior and I'm here with Berlin's answer to Gilbert and Sullivan, John Whitten. <laughs> 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 okay, so we're coming in hot. Oh, we're, I decided we're... to start strong this time in honour of it being our 11th episode of Project Studio Tea Break. 11 episodes! Have you earned your tea break this month, John? I have. I've earned my tea break and then some, Mike. I've been rehearsing for a session with a brilliant set of musicians and the single worst score I've ever received. <laughs> I mean, that must be a real rose gallery. I mean, yeah, oh, oh, believe me, I've had things on the back of napkins. I've had <laughs> music described to me, which I've then scribbled on the back of my hand before a gig, and none of them come close to this. But you know, it's even worse than a normal bad yeah. score. It's worse than the back of the hand, worse than a napkin, because it was printed in Sibelius. So there's no excuse. Well, that's the thing. When I met the musical director for Coffee, yeah, uh, I had a quick skim of the the scores, and I said, yeah. These look fine. Because they did. They look professional. They looked brilliant because Sibelius. Mm -hmm. Then I get them home and I realise that there's a, a piece in C minor, but there are no E flats, a lot of D sharps. Oh, no! And a lot of forced naturalised D naturals, um, <laughs> which is hard to read. <laughs> what, what I thought was some cool syncopated bass lines were actually... This was imported as MIDI from Logic. Yeah. And it was played with lots of formata and feeling and then just put in a 4-4 oh, no. template file. So you've got a blizzard of, like, hemi-demi semi-quavers and triplets which aren't and grace notes which shouldn't be. Oh, God, yeah. It's a brilliant challenge. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> it taxed your Sibelius skills to the limit. I feel like an archaeologist who's discovered like a, a semi-rounded stone and is trying to make the case that this was like an ornamental knife fertility figure to the ancient Mayans. <laughs> anyway, have you earned your tea break this month, Mike? Oh, God, really, really have I so thoroughly earned a tea break this oh, month. Ah, look at because us. <laughs> you've, we've both been hard at work with just <laughs> tremendous, like... The head, head, oh, what's the word? <laughs> head melting, exploding. Oh, it's not quite head f***ing, it's something else. Um, <laughs> the chipmunk's going to have something to say about that. Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> you better believe it. Okay, okay, keep your fur on. Yeah, so I've been doing critiques of mixes for the mix contest that we've been running on the Cambridge MT site. Awesome. So I've been critiquing about 50 mixes of the same multi-track. <gasps> okay, I'm beginning <laughs> to see. That's like two weeks of your life that goes really, really, really slowly. <laughs> have we got any shout back from last month's episode? Well, I mean, the first thing to say straight away is that we have a new patron. Do we now? And actually, he's already been a supporter of the Cambridge MT site, so he's an all-round lovely guy. It's a guy called Tom Stevenson. What a dude. Hi, Tom. Who was featured in in um, an article in Sound on Sound a while ago because I, I worked on one of the mixes for his band he's got a, this great singer Kelly that he works with and they have a band called Nerve 9 mm. in fact the production that I worked on with them is in the multi-track library now so you can go have a listen oh really okay. so, so he supported the site but I mean in general I have a feeling that Patreon may be having some kind of technical problems at the moment because oh yeah I was just checking out our Inaudi poll and it looks <laughs> like uh, it's caused our, our patron Brad mm -hmm. to, um, to select the wrong option by mistake <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly he meant to vote for me, but the, the system, I think, must have malfunctioned. For someone with so much experience and practice at it, you are a remarkably bad loser. It's... <laughs> Well, I mean, naturally, I messaged him uh, to, to alert him to this mistake, just so that he could correct it. <laughs> he could set the record straight. And he, he sent me a very curious reply, and his reply, I quote, was, mm -hmm. Now, if there were to be an Ingvi Malmsteen poll... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I just didn't understand what he meant. No, no, fair <laughs> Besides, surely an Ingvi Malmsteen poll wouldn't work because if your two options were A, is he a genius, or B, is he an idiot, you could choose both quite validly. <laughs> you would just have to select both, wouldn't you? It would be kind of just a <laughs> yes would be the answer to that poll. Yes, so Brad is on your side now. I think the lovely Bradley may have actually expected you to, to try and sabotage this, which is why he posted to our Facebook as well... <laughs> <laughs> Just to make public his rational love of beautiful music <laughs> and also a shout out to How to Win Against History, which has become his jam this month. Oh, yeah. Which I'm thrilled to hear. More power to that. More power to that. And more power to the beautiful, tranquil visions of Ludovico Ionaldi. <laughs> what are the numbers sitting out now? It's 2-1. I still have the lead. 
But there is everything to play We're for. making a sudden resurgence, though. We're the fastest growing option. Is this the beginning of the comeback, do you think? Look at the 2019 numbers. Look at how we've grown. Look at how far we've come. Now, I pointed out that this is episode 11, uh, which makes it, to those uh, numerological fans amongst you, <laughs> it makes it our first palindromic episode number. It does. Yeah, and this, uh, together with the general derision that we heaped on serialism last month, this uh, palindromic episode number reminded me of a fake poetry movement that some <laughs> friends and I made up at school. <laughs> Do tell. It was called syllabism. <laughs> and just like with serialism, uh, the manifesto was that basically the development of poetry had been held back mm. by the shackles of having to mean anything and <laughs> things like grammar and syntax and just, stuff. Just briefly. And that the purest expression was really only possible by freeing those plucky syllables from these constraints. <laughs> so basically it was just a bunch of meaningless syllables we just read out in a hammy kind of poetic style my goodness me <laughs> well, now what? very few of these lines stick in my memory but there are a couple that do including possibly the most classic couplet <laughs> here we go yes please we pop bomb ass bar wom bar ass bomb pop we oh a love woff pop oh pop woff up a low <laughs> It's moving. <laughs> that is some Vogon level poetry there. The thing is, you see, that's all palindromic. In this whole just taking the out of serialism <laughs> through the syllabism like dogma, it threw up some genuinely kind of interesting thoughts about what mm. what would you use to structure poetry if you took like the meaning and the grammar and the rhyme and stuff out of it. If you took the meaning of the language out of it. And he was using palindromes, that's what reminded me of it. I want to see your filing system such that these poems are still at your fingertips. <laughs> All these years later. Well, no, actually, I was looking to see if I could find any of them that we'd written down or any of the any records. I could find absolutely nothing. Mm. And these are just bits that I just remember because I found it so funny for so many years and just remembered those lines. Incredible. The other thing he used to do was he would take a line of a well-known poem, Mm. break it up into its syllables and make a syllabist poem out of the syllables of someone else's line. See, I know he's joking. This sounds pretty cool, Mike. That's the thing. Well, I'll tell you what. Tell me if you can guess which line it is. Okay, okay. Here's the only line of that poem poem that I remember. It goes, Cloud dirt, I as lonely as I dirt cloud. When I beheld a host of daffodils. Indeed, indeed. You see, you got straight away. But you see, even to this day, I think, actually, that was inspired that we came up with syllabism. Because it's no less silly than serialism. Yeah. And actually, you could easily imagine someone coming out with the idea of syllabism as a serious poetry movement. <laughs> and I think all the best <laughs> funny ideas could be real. And really, I can't see anything that would stop you from standing up in some kind of artistic environment <laughs> saying this stuff as if it were real. Okay, I would rather go and see a syllabist reading yeah. by a poet who actually attended to these sounds and was mm. really believed in what they were doing than I would go and see a very serious serialist concert. Well, you see, you, you've missed out. Because we did actually do a couple of live shows. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> Please did. tell me these are on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> and I tell you, there was much more enjoyment in our live syllabus shows, I think, than I've ever seen in a serialist concert. <laughs> All right, so this is a shout out. Yeah. All you punk rocker serialists yeah. who hear us and are just shouting at your wireless with, you know, you don't understand serialists can party. Mm. Get in touch. Let let us know what we're missing out on. But until that time, yeah. I am looking forward to your trip to Berlin. We're going to find a little salon somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to wear our, come up with some syllabus poetry. Wear our black turtlenecks, and we're going to just throw down some <laughs> syllabus genius. The syllabus poetry slam is going to happen. Absolutely, berets <laughs> and all, whatever the German beret equivalent is. And it's time for the news, our monthly news segment on what's hot, what's hip, what's happening in the music and geographical world. <laughs> so what are the freshest slices of new gossip and information? Are these, these are hot, hot off the press. Jones, this news starts with a bit of a story. Oh, right. Because it's the story of me casting around for what to do with news. <laughs> and I think something anyone can sympathise with. I think we've all been there sorting out the news segment for a podcast. And... I wanted to do something about film music. Okay. Because there's some interesting stuff happening at the moment in film music and it's got an amazing history. Mm. But you, there's a problem with talking about that. Can, can I hazard a guess? Or what held me back? Uh, you know nothing about film music? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's nice of you to append film in that <laughs> sentence. Um, no, well, while that is potentially a barrier, it hasn't stopped me yet. No, no, um, well, me neither. No. <laughs> there we go. There we go. It served us fairly well. Now, it's the, I realise that if we're talking about all this great iconic music, people are going to want to hear it. Mm, mm. And as this podcast is not currently yet owned by Universal, we're... Um, Shout out to you guys. We we can't just play it in. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, but John, it's a it's a music podcast. How are you going to talk about? I mean, do you mean you're going to find some sort of music that literally no one would want to hear? Ah. So my topic this month is sound art. <laughs> sound art. Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. Go on then. Sound art. It's um. I mean, the the term comes from the eighties. The actual behaviour comes from far before. It's hard to define, mm. but basically it's when you take music away from those shallow, crowd-pleasing, pandering pansies of musicians. They always ruin it. They do. They do with their notes and patterns. Aesthetics. Coming out their bottoms and um, put it in the hands of serious artists. Yeah. So different people disagree. I would say John Cage is sort of where it kind of branches off into sound art. Oh, right. And sound art is great because it's very easy to make fun of. They, <laughs> they sort of do a lot of the work for you. <laughs> for example, I could tell you about Shore Scene. All right. That's an interactive, ongoing project where viewers are invited to recreate the sound of the ocean by rubbing their hands on a carpet. On a carpet? <laughs> on a carpet. God, do you realise we've inadvertently been participating in this artwork all along <laughs> with our toast foley? We, we have. Or maybe we've inadvertently started a new piece called Toast. But spelt T-O-umlaut S-7. Well, there's got to be a zero and, and some capitals in the middle somewhere. I wouldn't be remotely surprised. Mm. And this stuff, it's not limited to kind of dark backrooms in the artier European cities. Mm. The Turner Prize, you remember a couple of years ago when Susan Phillips was the first sound artist All right. to win a Turner? Yeah, no, she won it with, she put up a bunch of speakers underneath some Glaswegian bridges and they played on a loop her doing a lot of unaccompanied Bowie covers. B Bowie covers? <laughs> and um, some folk songs occasionally. I thought it was basically non-consensual Bowie abuse. <laughs> More or less. I mean, aren't there laws against that kind of thing now? <laughs> you would hope so. And, you know, a well-intentioned podcast can't play the theme from Star Wars, but she can get away with that. Yeah. Maybe if we did an acapella cover. That's it. Yeah, I'll leave you to do the stabs. I'm not that good on rhythm this time in the morning. You gotta go jump, jump, get a jump, jump, jump. John Williams, Williams, John, John, John Williams. Yeah, that'd be good actually. Look into that. Watch this space. And all that. So it's a big deal. Mm. And as I as I read through different artist sites and looking for rubbish things to make fun of, mm. I was struck by the horrible truth. A lot of this stuff is really cool. Oh no! <laughs> Awesome! And I I sorry, I don't know what to tell you <laughs> other than like this stuff's brilliant. Right. It's just genius. Uh, do you know Alvin Lucia? No, I imagine none of these names are going to mean anything to me, but go on. Well, I don't know how acoustically obvious it is. I am reading them from a text file, so they're not currently household names to me either. <laughs> but in 1969, he created a beautiful piece of art. It's on YouTube. It's called I'm Sitting in a Room. Okay. And he had a paragraph of text, and he sat in a room, true to his word, and he said... I'm sitting in a room yeah. different from the one you're in now. I'm recording the sound of my speaking voice and I'm going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech, with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant frequencies and, you know, on, on for a couple of sentences. And then the recording of him saying this was played back into the room and recorded and then played back into the room and recorded and back into the room. Wow. And you listen to each of these iterations. Wow. And exactly as he describes it, slowly the natural resonant frequencies of the room overtake the content of what he's saying. And it's especially poignant when taken in the context of his last sentence, I regard this activity not so much as a demonstration of a physical fact, but more as a way to smooth out any irregularities my speech might have. 
because Alvin Lucia had a debilitating stutter, which you can hear in this recording. Ah. You can hear the stutter when he starts to speak, and then slowly this otherworldly drone music ambient wash comes in. Wow. It's incredibly satisfying. That's fabulous. Okay, so just to kind of reground us, someone did an awful piece where people were told to go to a forest and listen to some leaves. So that's laughably <laughs> rubbish. In the interest of balance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got that out, my sis. Good, good, good. And one other that I want to tell you about, which also kind of talks about audio deterioration. Well, because you talked about uh, dis- destructive loops. What was it called? Disintegration loops. Yeah. Bloody lovely. Go lie in a room with a bottle of booze and <laughs> listen to that. And... Go put yourself in a flotation oh, tank. Oh, just do Because these things are super clever. So the other good one. I um, I live in Berlin. Really? I do. I live in <laughs> Berlin. It's pretty cool place. Pretty cool of me pretty cool so is this next piece like pure smugness pure (laughs) smugness and i want to kind of shout out to our listeners in places like brentford on tweed or wapple on brent (laughs) and just say you know i i feel for you i hear you but i don't understand you because i live in berlin (laughs) it's so cold and dark here and i haven't seen green in about six months but um Someone had set up a number of fans, yeah, floor fans, and had put various bits of styrofoam about the place. Styrofoam? Styrofoam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is already shaping up to be a goodie. <laughs> and it looked great because they'd arranged in such a way that some styrofoams were caught in like whirlwinds, were caught in vortexes. Okay, right. And were flying around and jumping up and down. Other ones were kind of bashing into walls of styrofoam. Okay. So it was this maze, this swirling maze of styrofoam. And on the backs of all the stationary pieces, there were piezo microphones. All right. Which went back to a mixing desk. Yeah. And you were encouraged to get in the middle and start chucking stuff around oh right to just really go nuts you could hear the space in an incredible way as things got crazy the sound got crazy wow and it felt like a really sensitive scoring but of course it wasn't it was just a very honest straightforward audio representation of a completely mad event (laughs) of a completely mad happenstance of a sort of (laughs) snowstorm of styrofoam uh, a name which I offered, but which I've not been taken up on. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, p- putting on our black turtlenecks, as mentioned earlier in the episode. Yeah. I mean, have, have you experienced sound art that's particularly moved you or that you thought was particularly ridiculous? Oh, I'll tell you what, here's something that actually really did make a kind of impact on me. And I think of almost like sound art is that the Frankfurt Music Messe. Mm. The Frankfurt Music Messe, of course, is Europe's biggest music tech show. And uh, when I was at Sound on Sound, Mm. I'd be going there every year. And I I must have gone, I don't know, every year for about 10 years. Okay. And there was one hall that was the percussion hall. (laughs) And you'd just be hit by this wave of sound from more than 100 drummers, at least, all wailing away at various different drum kits from different manufacturers. That sounds incredible. It was the kind of noise that actually physically made you feel a bit scared. (laughs) I think it was a primal thing. It's like, if you heard that sound in the wild, you would run away really quickly. Either something is erupting or there's a stampede (laughs) of wildebeest heading your way. And it's not worth your while to stick around to find out which one. But what was really funny was that during the course of me going to the music messe, over that, like, ten years, mm. that sound slowly dwindled away as all those electronic drum kits came along. Oh, interesting. Until eventually it sounded like a whole hall full of touch typers. <laughs> <laughs> just, just this kind of gentle background clatter going on the whole time. That's kind of magnificent, though. <laughs> It's kind of evolution of sound. I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's- but, no, I can't think of any kind of sound art that I've heard as a thing that's made me go, oh, wow. Mm. I think, yeah, I must be essentially too conservative. I think you must just be a little bit too shallow and not as artistic as me. That's fundamentally it. Or the other people here in Berlin. That's it. It's this conservative Munich thing. That's what it is. Famous for it. (laughs) That reminds me of a a John Cage piece, a brilliant con... Con Jade piece, which is actually his evil twin brother. <laughs> the one who did 4 minutes 33 seconds of white noise. Yes, there you go. Of all the frequencies, <laughs> he wrote a piece which was... Uh, I'm going to misremember this horribly. It was like, go to this address in Chicago on this date, right. at this time, and listen. Oh, right. And it was selected, as far as I know, for no reason at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and the first year 
a few people did it and, you know, enjoyed the traffic noises and whatever. Yeah. Of course, now it's a huge event. Oh, wow. <laughs> and people swarm. And kind of an annual flash mob. An annual flash mob at this place on this date. And so what you are able to hear on this place on this date has been completely transformed by asking people to go and listen. Wow. That begins to mess with my head, that does. Yeah. It's a bit like that basic paradox of science. That the moment you measure anything, you change it. Yes, yes. That by observing things, you kind of somehow augment them. Speaking of which, please subscribe on iTunes. Yeah, and maybe you can change this. (laughs) (laughs) And so it is that the gentle slap of palm skin on... Wait, wait, wait! Forehead. Oh, thank God, Mike. (laughs) (laughs) I had my headphones half off. I was making a run for the door. <laughs> but you pulled it back at the last minute. Out of the gutter, Witten. Uh, <laughs> it heralds in our face palm of the month. It's my honour once more to treat everyone to another story from my sometimes not so distant past. <laughs> in this case, however, it is safely into the distant past. I'm dredging up another classic from the archives. Past the statute of limitations, I hope. Yeah, this is from kind of close to the beginning of my kind of engineering career. This was my first, like, proper in-house engineer role at a residential studio in Milton Keynes, the spiritual home of the roundabout. Completely. So this, we're talking wax cylinders and <laughs> gramophones and... Cheeky. This sort of handy tech. <laughs> well, it wasn't all analog studio, so I can't entirely have a go so, at you. Not miles wrong. But yeah, so this was about 20 years ago, mm. you know, when John was still nibbling Farley's rusks. <laughs> so I was, I was the in-house, in-house engineer at this uh, studio, and a band called Reef came in, who were big at the end of the 90s. Mm. They just had a number one album in the UK called Glow, Mm -hmm. and they were coming in to do a couple of B-sides for singles of their second album. They were coming in with a producer who they were just kind of trying out to see whether they got on. This is something bands often did around then. They'd do a few B-sides with someone to see whether they wanted to work with them further. And the producer in question was a guy called Al Clay, who was a a bit of a legend. He's done like the Pixies, and he mixed um, one of my favourite Stereophonics albums, uh, Performance of Cocktails, and he's worked with Therapy and various other people. Yeah. And I was mostly just really assisting. Okay. And their guitarist, Reef's guitarist, is a guy called Kenwin House. He's a bit of a guitar aficionado. Okay. And he brought his beautiful instruments with him. And we'd done the kind of live band takes. And then he was doing guitar overdubs in the control room. Mm. So he, he'd been playing some overdub with some guitar he had. Mm. And so he, he said, oh, can you go take this guitar, pop it back on the stand and go get me my other guitar? Yeah. Which is this beautiful, like, vintage, sunburst Les Paul. <laughs> Mike, whenever we're doing a face farm and you really get into the value and quality of a piece of equipment, I get scared. <laughs> I get absolutely <laughs> terrified of what's coming next. You know, I think, how much knowledge I have about electric guitars and amps and things. Mm-hmm. It's about what you could write on the back of a postage stamp. <laughs> about what you could write on a, on a plectrum. Indeed. More or less. If I knew what one of those were. <laughs> I'm not an electric guitarist. That's not really been my field. And electric guitars and electric guitars, they, they frighten me a little bit. <laughs> How is that? It was just because I meet a lot of people who are really good guitarists and really know their stuff, and I'm supposed to be an engineer. Mm-mm-mm. I think, well, they have kind of electronic elements to it. It's so much to do with engineering somehow. Mm. And yet, uh, yeah, I have trouble telling one end from the other, really. It's, and, and so I, I was already a bit nervous about this. So I thought, God, this vintage, like, sunburst lead ball has got to be worth probably more than me. Yeah. So I, like, walked trembling into the tape room, which was next door to the control room, mm. to get this guitar off its stand and picked it up in both hands, <laughs> desperate not to drop it. One hand just above the weatherboard body joins the neck and I was one underneath it cradling it yeah and checking to make sure I didn't like chip the varnish or whatever on the door frame or anything as I went past yep but there's a but why is there a but (laughs) as you know I am not a short person (laughs) I come in about six foot three (laughs) and I was probably wearing DMs at the time so that would have added another inch and while paying attention to the body of the guitar I wasn't paying attention to the neck and the headstock oh my god So I walked into the control room with a distance of maybe between six or eight feet between me and Kenwin House, (laughs) clumped the headstock of the guitar on the (laughs) doorframe with a a resounding (laughs) schling. Now, 
I, I will leave it to the listener's imagination to imagine quite how happy he was about this. <laughs> quite the look of glee, which I'm sure covered his features in that moment. <laughs> to be fair to him, he was remarkably restrained. <laughs> Had I been in his spot, I'm not sure I could have been quite as restrained. Right. Thankfully, no damage was incurred because I was Ooh. going at such a snail's pace in my <laughs> nervousness. <laughs> So more of a slow press into the door frame than an actual hit. I think the guitar managed to find I, I've seen him playing it at other gigs, so at least it was repairable. <laughs> and of course, the funny thing is that of all the parts you could have hit, it being an electric guitar, you could whack the side that you were protecting so carefully. You could <laughs> knock the body with a hammer and it would sound exactly the same. But you mess with the head and the neck. <laughs> so there are a number of morals to this story, I felt. And the, one of them... <laughs> what can we take away? Is that as an engineer, I think it's it quite important to know and admit when you're out of your comfort zone. Right. Because actually, in the situation, I was worried about not knowing what to do with this guitar. Mm. Whereas actually, from his perspective, I think he would probably have preferred if I'd said to him, look, I really am not comfortable dealing with electric guitars. I don't want to damage your guitar. Mm. Can I ask you to get it? Mm. You know, I'm happy to do anything else, but I don't want to risk damaging your guitar. He would probably have been less annoyed at me saying that yeah. than me clonking the headstock of his vintage <laughs> Les Paul on the door frame. And since then, I'm very much like that with electric guitars. I mean, I know a little bit more about them now than I did before. I'm sure. But still, with guitarists, if I want to get some kind of sound or, or other, I'll say, well, look, I, this is the sound I want. Can you help me get it? Yeah, this is your region. This is. Your... Or is it safe to switch this off? Or is it safe to <laughs> unplug this? Like, you know, I just don't trust myself at all with electric guitars. So I, but I, I just say that. I leave that to the guitarist. Knowing what you're good at and knowing what you can get help with is the way forward. And also, just a general rule of thumb that served me very well, which is mm. basically to leave about a foot of clearance per, like, 100 grand it's worth. <laughs> you know, if something's worth 100 grand, leave a good foot of clearance between me and it. Yeah, yeah. Assume that everything is going to jump at you. I mean, it did cause me a certain amount of difficulty because the tape room itself was only about 12 foot across. Mm. And, and Nigel Kennedy once brought his violin and put it in the tape room. <laughs> really now? And really to follow my thing, I would have had to have somehow like gone Spider-Man across the <laughs> ceiling or something <laughs> to get into the control room. You don't need to put it out in an open field. Yeah, it would have been tricky. I have a rule of thumb when I'm recording or playing for anything more expensive than a ukulele of mine, mm. I move it and no one else touches it. Good idea, yeah. This is not because I am any more dexterous yeah. than anyone else. Quite the opposite. I have got more knocks and scrapes on my instruments than I would care to admit, and it's one of the very good reasons I should never become a parent. But it's just because... <laughs> <laughs> it's purely because if I drop my instrument, that's okay. Yeah. If you drop my instrument... That's complicated. Yeah. I would just so much rather it be my fault when it happens, because of course it will happen. It's actually saying to them, I don't want you to have to be responsible if this gets damaged. No. Because things do get damaged from time to time. There you go. I mean, that's another one of the little things that comes out of this kind of thing for me, is that obviously I now am in a situation where I end up with a lot of people helping me with things when I'm doing sessions. You know, when you're doing Project Studio stuff, the lines are blurred. Mm. And people say, oh, can I set this mic up for you? Or can I plug this in? Or you might have someone coming along with you just to help unload stuff, or whatever else. Yeah, yeah. And it's just that thing of remembering what it felt like to be the person who was really intimidated by Ken Winhouse's guitar. Yeah. And thinking, okay, well, if I'm in the situation where they might feel intimidated from moving some of my stuff around, what can I do about that? Yeah. I mean, in some cases, it's just saying which bits they should move and which bits they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. A good example is ribbon mics. Okay. You know, I have some ribbon mics now. So when I put a ribbon mic up, I just say to everyone in the room, Look, this is a ribbon mic. <laughs> uh, with most mics, I don't mind people moving them around or stuff, but just be careful, because if you move this or if you waft it with air, it can break the ribbon. But at the same time, what I'll usually say is, look, I've got a spare ribbon with me if, in case it, it busts. It's not a huge disaster, but just to let you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's just letting people know how much damage they could possibly do <laughs> and what they, what they should do and when they should do it yeah. to try and take that intimidation element of it out of the equation. Completely. Being able to communicate what you can lug around like their chairs you're setting out for a school assembly yeah and just understand that if you mess with this you're choosing to take on the responsibility of the safety of this expensive fragile bit of kit and if you would rather not do that that's completely like, that's not your job really yeah. and i think also when you're working in certainly as an engineer in, in kind of project studio environments it's easy to forget how intimidating it is to people who are being recorded that there's all this technology around right yeah you know if a singer's there in front of a microphone there is this little bit at the back of their head that's going 
cool, that microphone looks a bit expensive. Will you be worried if I'm, I'm moving around when I'm singing and I, and I hit the mic stand? Mm. There is that little bit of intimidation the whole way there. And it's your job as an engineer, I think, particularly in project studio situations where you're so close with the artists in terms of you're all sharing each other's jobs. Yeah. It's kind of incumbent on you to try and get rid of that intimidation to some extent. On the other side, from um, nervous technicians, mm. are the technicians who play my instruments. Oh. And I really do try to be chilled out about this kind of thing, at least as far as my face is concerned. And <laughs> I really enjoy teaching people something about my instrument. But ones who just jump on while I'm getting a cup of tea. Yeah. My, my 98 string dollsman that I've just been tuning for the last solid hour. Yeah. You know, will wander over with this mock casual swagger and... Oh, oh, what's this? Oh, this looks like a nice dulcimer. I wonder how it strums. I have seen people put their hands all over it. <laughs> That's another half hour of my time. And it's just, I appreciate the confidence and the self starteringness but um, The idiot savant nature of it. <laughs> yes, there you go. The give it a go, the DIY attitude. It could be the goodwill hunting of dulcimerists just stepping up to your machine. I think I'd feel worse about that. Yeah, just imagine someone saunters up who's just been calling up some cables and with a pencil behind his ear he goes, oh, this looks fun. How does it work? And then comes out with something that sounds like fabulous. <laughs> Something's truly good. At that point, I kick it onto the floor. And I say, you know, it's broken now, isn't it? It's all your fault. Yeah, never do that again. Stick to engineering, you talentless hack. I would shout and then, and then retire to my trailer. Sobbing. Yeah, no, you're right. You, you've made me realise that there are much worse things than people treating your instrument badly. I can imagine that whole thing of people grabbing your instrument, whatever, must get worse when you're on tour mm. because your instrument instruments are almost like the only stable bit of your life when you're going you're in a different place every time you know when we're on tour i will normally keep my instrument backstage until sound check and i mean it'll be with me yeah i'm thinking about the dulcimer here well you wouldn't have any boxer shorts unless you had your dulcimer with you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So for setting up the stage and stuff, I put up the stand and then I just keep the instrument. So there isn't a moment where it's out of my sight. You don't need to give hostages to fortune in a live situation. In large part because I know that the next three weeks or whatever relies on this instrument being fine. Yeah. But interestingly, I don't think I've ever had the experience of a venue tech grab my instrument and taking it for a ride. The people who do that are radio techs. Oh, right. Because man... They've seen everyone. They've recorded, uh, you know, Nick Jagger and Nick Jagger. I'm going to start that one again. Lesser known as uh, Baby Brother. <laughs> Looks less like a saddlebag. <laughs> He played with um, Con Jade. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Actually, in one of his early records. They've seen everyone. They've recorded Mick Jagger. They did a session with Prince back in the day, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder. Yeah. And so when you come in with your little project, that's cute. So it's that added whiff of condescension on top of everything else that's bad about the situation. Absolutely. Oh, that's a jolly little instrument you've got there. <laughs> Does it make a noise? I hate it when they say that about my penis. <laughs> I do. It's just insult to injury, really, isn't it? Like the Delphic oracles of old, we see it as our God-given duty to bestow truth and wisdom on this dark and ignorant world. Weren't they always stoned as well out of their heads? They were completely high on an unrelated note. I can see the appeal of the lifestyle, actually. <laughs> Getting high and telling people what to do. Yeah. It's not a bad idea, is it? Yeah, not bad at all. Anyway, we're losing our um, mystic import as, as we speak. So what is the oracle decreed? We have a missive here, a plea for wisdom mm. from a lovely David Green from Shropshire. In your recent discussion of key changes, you mentioned the lyrical tonight device. Oh, yes. Where any chorus could be finished with the word tonight, upping its coolness factor by 10. <laughs> This got me thinking, are there other lyrical devices? The more overused, the better, uh, which you are aware of. Wow. Well, I mean, first question, how much do you listen to lyrics? I'm a big fan, actually. You are? Oh, wow, okay. I'm all about the poetry of the song, man. Because I've often mixed stuff, and then literally the following week, I've been unable to recall a single lyric. <laughs> <laughs> having like been listening to it for like two or three days straight the number of times I've gone oh I really like that song I, the, what, what were the lyrics again <laughs> but that's so interesting so what what when you think of that song what's it about it's about the way the melody and the harmony and the rhythm and things fit together and the, the arrangement and stuff somehow it's so easy for me often to phase out the lyrics I mean it's got to be a pretty bad lyric mm. <laughs> to set off my lyric alarm <laughs> to, to break through okay good because that actually sounds like you've just got a very effective filter here and that all the lyrics you can 
remember will be the most hackneyed and overused examples. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's it. I think this is a wonderful thing. I mean, the thing I always that always comes to mind when I think of cliches is rhymes, like uh, heart and apart. Heart and start is another favourite. Yeah, my own and alone. <laughs> and of course, one of my very favourites, knees and please. Knees and please. That's such a random one. Wait, wait. When and who? I beg you on my knees, Layla. Oh, I'm yeah, begging, no. baby, please, Layla. But I mean, the knees, please thing is, I've had Coldplay use it, and it's in just about every other soul song. That's what you do with knees, you beg on them. But there are some really awful ones as well. It's like, people have been trying forever to rhyme the word love with something, and the number of people who've rhymed it with glove. <laughs> I've done think I've ever heard a rhyme of love and glove that hasn't been just tremendously contrived crowbarred into a song I mean the one I'm thinking of is a sting one it's like in the cold weather a man needs a glove no and at times like these a simple man needs love no god that it's like k clunk <laughs> oh Horrible. Also, I take issue with the idea that anyone needs a glove. Well, I know. Yeah. I mean, that's almost worse than no gloves at all. You've now got this huge temperature imbalance between your hands. And the other one that just doesn't work either is baby crazy. Oh, yeah. The number of times those two things have been rhymed and they just don't really rhyme. I will go with you there. That's not what rhyme means. Uh, if this reminds me, back at Sound on Sound, mm. one of the things I was responsible for was the uh, sample shop column. Oh, right. Which is indeed the where I wrote that Queen's English review. Um, but I was responsible for organising it and getting all the libraries out to people and basically compiling the column every month. But one of the things that it was my responsibility to do mm. was something that they've stopped doing since, which was a little box that appeared in every article where the star ratings were characterised in different ways. So it'd be like star ratings, films of the 80s, and there'd be like a one-star film and a five-star <laughs> film and all the ones in between, right? So there'd always be five options. Okay, okay. And one of the things we did was star hackneyed rhymes. <laughs> and I remember Baby Crazy was at the top. Don't blame you. What was, can you remember any of the others that made it into that hallowed list? Well, I mean, some of those ones that I mentioned, I mean, Heart Apart was definitely in there. Right. It's got to have been. But there were loads of other ones. I mean, th th basically, it was the classic Friday afternoon activity. <laughs> It's Starbucks time, everyone, and we'd be kind of like six of us in the office, and we'd be coming up with ideas for, yeah. for Star Wars. The most hotly contested, I think, was the most 80s film ever. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, I mean, there's so much choice. I might put forward Lethal Weapon? No, Labyrinth. Labyrinth is pretty good. There are some, there are some heavy shoulder pads, but uh, no, there, there are ones that they p*** all over those from a height. <laughs> oh, wow, okay, give it to me. I remember some of the top scorers were things like Cocktail. Okay, yeah, yeah, no fair. Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Breakfast Club, that kind of thing. <laughs> but um, yeah. possibly the most 80s of all of them was Mannequin. I haven't seen Mannequin. What's Mannequin? It had everything. It had the music. It was about fashion okay shoulder pads galore huge hair yeah it was really really good <laughs> flash dance i think might have been in there as well dirty dancing something like that oh. we spent so many hours discussing that <laughs> for one little <laughs> tiny sub shop starbucks this tiny box in a corner <laughs> anyway sorry uh, hauling us back hauling us in a wide arc back around to lyric there must be more in-depth cliches than this i have a proposition go on which is the hackneyed lyric Hey. Okay. And now, to be clear, I'm not talking about Avril Lavigne, Hey, Hey, You, You Aren't Like Your Girlfriend. Okay. Brilliant, original, wonderful song. I'm talking about the fraternal hay of Americana lumberjacks drinking moonshine under a large filament harvest moon. Give me an example. Okay, so any song ever written by Mumford & Sons, when at some point they all go, hey! Oh, right. Or, oh, the Lumineers, who actually had a song called Hey Ho. Another one. Hey! Yeah. There's some banjo going on, there's this double bass going, it's all building, and then everyone says, hey! They've probably called each other brother and sister and mother. Yep. And then, whoop! Just, hey, is kind of shouted out as a percussive stab. But does that really count as a lyric thing? I mean, it's not as part of the lyrical content. <laughs> I wonder whether that's coming a bit far towards, like, arrangement cliches and melodic cliches almost. Often, the lyric, hey, makes as much sense as anything else in the entire song. So oh, actually, that's made me think of one. Oh, yes, please. And that is basically any song that has the word hello in it. <laughs> I mean, ever since, like, hello, is it me you're looking for? And, I was going to say, that, that and Adele are the two I can think of. Yeah, but the Adele one, I immediately thought the moment there was a hello in it. I mean, the concept of having a conversation in the song where you use the word hello <laughs> just seems to be a bit hackneyed now. Maybe it's just because I know Hello Is It Me You're Looking For a bit too well. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, I mean, who, who was the guy who sang that? Lionel Richie. Lionel Richie, did you know he, um, he's opened a butcher now? A butcher? A butcher in East London. I sense there's... It's called Halal. Is it meat you're looking <laughs> for? <laughs> the moment I... I, I was just... 
I was just getting that. I was thinking, hang on, ahoy there, gag. I see you coming on the horizon. I saw your realisation dawning, which is why I threw in the punchline like a Hail Mary, being like, no, quickly, before he guesses. <laughs> the comprehension was in mid-dawn. You should be ashamed of yourself. I am. Daily. Daily. <laughs> I read... Now, I'm going to show my cards here slightly uh, as a middle-class English guy. Go on. When I say that I was recently reading an interesting article in The Guardian. (laughs) There, it's out. (laughs) Fine. I'm sorry, everyone. Well, it beats Hansard. (laughs) I mean, what honestly doesn't? There's a light at the end of this tunnel of lyrical predictability. Yeah. Because there's more and more popular pop music coming out that's not in English. Yes, you're right. So this was talking about the rise of of K-pop and Latin American pop hugely. I mean, I don't know if you heard this little track called Despacito. Yeah, well, I was thinking Despacito, Gangnam Style. This article was talking about how it's all because of internet and the Tories or something. Yeah. But it made me think, you know, as there's more and more linguistic variety, we're probably going to find our way out of hackneyed rhymes and predictable lyrical constructions just because it's different words. It's a whole different vocabulary. You can rhyme baby with something else in another (laughs) language. (laughs) Exactly. And honestly, I'd recommend to any songwriters struggling to kind of find that lyrical flow, give Spanish a try. Okay. If a word doesn't end in ito, which is how Despacito works, then it will probably end in Ita. Yeah. Or you can make it end in Ita. Well, also, pretty much any past verb ends in Ado, doesn't it? Yeah. So, you're flying. You're off to the races, my son. It's a bit like English songs that end in Asian, isn't it? Ooh, maybe, uh, damnation. In fact, there is a really good one that has loads and loads of Asian words in it. Oh, I can't remember what it is now. It'll come back to me. Uh, What else have you got? Here I Am was one I found quite a lot of. Oh, right. And it seems like both kind of a popular thing for the moody solo singer-songwriter to sing. Also, the single most unnecessary statement (laughs) Um, (laughs) in any sort of semantic (laughs) context. Yeah. It's like, (laughs) duh. Unless the second line is duh, then you're you're really not adding anything to the conversation. Oh, I've got one. One's just occurred to me, and this is one I really hate. Okay, hit me. Any song that tells you about them getting up in the morning. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you including the Beatles in this? I suppose so, but that bit of that song, yeah. It's just like so unimaginative. Yeah. You, you get the impression that this person sat down with a pencil and paper and thought... I have nothing to say. Yes. I'm just going to describe my day. I woke up in the morning. And, yeah, yeah. And whenever I think of that, I always think of the um, the advertising jingle for um, Vitalite, where someone put new words to that reggae song, Israelite. Oh, yeah. So it's wake up in the morning, wanting some breakfast, wonder what I'm going to put on my toast. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, Vitalite. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a horrible thing to do to that song, but it's really quite funny. It also reminds me of that absolutely cracking one by Desiree. Okay, I like Desiree, so this is going to be... I will look it up, because it is so okay. astonishing. While you're Googling that, I just want to make a defence of the I Woke Up This Morning song start, and I hope we can make an exception for Keisha's Wake Up In The Morning Feeling Like P. Diddy. <laughs> That's all right, yeah, I'll cover that. That's not quite so every day, is yeah. it? But, I mean, anyone who just describes the most banal stuff because you get the impression that they couldn't think of anything more interesting. <laughs> it's yes. like, I walked out of my door and walked down the road. Yeah, why do we need to think it's so unimportant? <laughs> ah, I've got it. Here it is. So it's, I don't want to see a ghost. It's a sight I fear the most. I'd rather have a piece of toast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, what is that song? It's from a song called Life, which was a big hit for Desiree. I think it was her first Life, oh life, oh life. Have a piece of toast. And actually, it's very fitting. I hadn't thought about it. It should be our theme song. (laughs) We should do edits of the song filled with our toast foley. (laughs) We could do a toast foley based cover of Desiree's Life. Agreed. There are a lot of cliched similes, though, aren't there? Oh, yeah. When something is like something else, or as something else. I'm with you. You know, it's as hot as fire, it's as cold as ice. Cold as ice, yeah. It's raging like a storm, it's, <laughs> it cuts like a knife. <laughs> you know, Cold as ice and cuts like a knife, those are frequent bedfellows. There have got to be more kind of similes like that. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely sure there are. Your heart's like stone. Oh, like you're, you're breaking mine with these <laughs> emotional appeals. <laughs> Like I knew it would, or like I thought it would, like a which again is very meaning light. It is that sort of thing because it doesn't actually tell you what it is. It just says with a certain degree of smugness that the author of the song knew it all along. It's basically code for 
I've written three lines, but there are four lines in this verse. <laughs> it's almost like an extension of the Tonight Trick. It's that kind of, well, there's a bit I still need, and yeah. I've run out of meaning that I wanted to get across in this bit. <laughs> How can I just tack a bit on the end? So in honour of breakfast time, it is that segment of the podcast where we ask... What is your jam? What is your jam? And to celebrate the occasion, we have this 24 carat gold. <laughs> it's damn fine. Toast foley from Mr. Witten. <laughs> it's from you. Oh, no, it's from me, isn't it? <laughs> I've forgotten what we'd agreed. You see, this is the kind of preparation <laughs> that people expect. The kind of professionalism. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> to celebrate this, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we have this yeah. 24 carat gold foley from Mr. Senior. 24 carat gold. Here it comes. Paying attention, I hope. Here it comes. Damn, that's good. And it was pretty good. Mike, that's really good. I took effort. I got this piece of this piece of, obviously of toast, obviously. No. <laughs> obviously. You know those kind of foily things you get around vitamin C tablets. Oh yeah. I've got yeah. one of those and I, I look how I, how carefully I cut it into little strips so that it would crunch so that it would create the he sort of feathered the edges. I held my hand in a resonant cavity to try and get that. No, I noticed, and I think you moving your mouth behind it, actually, that might have been some sort of <laughs> yeah. resonant filter sweeping that you managed there. I kind of hoped you hadn't noticed that one. It's a bit like when people play wah guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you know you've seen it, don't you? Oh, wow. There's got to be a tumbler of compilations of guitar Well, guitar facial expressions. <laughs> that would go well alongside the expressions of keyboardists when they have the pitch bend toggle all the way up. <laughs> That's a... Oh. I noticed you're using the little shoulder shrug thing. It's a whole body experience. There's that hunch that you get. It's the kind of Quasimodo thing <laughs> going on. Sorry to do that while you're drinking. I don't think you are. I think that's a lie. <laughs> I'm overcome with remorse. <laughs> Imagining Quasimodo playing in Dream Theatre now. Yeah. So that's my situation. Oh, that went down the wrong way. <laughs> All right. Well, while you're recovering, I'll start telling you about my jam. Tell me about your jam this week. Now, this is something I may be preaching to the choir here because I believe you use the same DAW that I do. Uh, I am a huge Reaper fan myself. Oh, well, in which case, this can be a communal What's Your Jam because oh. today I would like to wax lyrical about Reaper. Oh, I mean, how do I love Reaper? Let me count the ways. It really is. <laughs> I mean, how long have you been using Reaper for? I've been using Reaper for about the last three and a half years. So I'm pretty new. Okay, right, because I've been with them probably about 10 years now. Okay. So let's have the kind of reasons why I like Reaper. The first one, and this is more than anything, is the fact that it is made by a company that has an U-matron name. <laughs> it's made by a company named Kokos. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you could not make it up. Oh. It immediately endears them to me. Shall we finish the podcast here? I think we could. Thanks so much for listening. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> But the second reason is that I just love the fact that it doesn't treat you like an idiot or a child and it gives you enough rope to hang yourself. (laughs) You know, uh, when I moved from Logic and Cubase, the thing that was really annoying me was that I think in Logic, you couldn't set up a stereo send at the time. Really? So I couldn't set up a send to a delay where the delay return would mimic the stereo positioning of my dry signal, if I'd pan my dry signal. Oh, right. You could do it, but it was just a monumental kludge. Right. And in Cubase at the time, I think it was in SX at the time, or SX2, you couldn't send from an effect return to another effect. So you couldn't send your delay to a reverb. Really? Side chaining was a kludge too. And I just thought, oh, this is so tedious. Mm -hmm. And then Reaper comes along. It doesn't have any different types of channels. All the tracks are the same. All the channels are the same. And you can send MIDI and audio from anywhere to anywhere. I mean, I was so like a kid in a sweet shop. (laughs) And I remember the first mix that I did in Reaper, I did a first section of the mix and sent it to the guy to see whether he liked the direction I was doing. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I like the sound of that. You can finish the mix up. And I went back to try and finish the mix and the whole mix fell apart (laughs) because I just choked myself in in virtual patch chords, basically. And I had to redo the mix because I just had too much fun with the routing. What had you put into place? What witchcraft? Oh, I was having buses and sends and (laughs) side chains and all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, the thing is that when I mix, I like to work from first principles rather than working from the basis of what the software can do. Right. So I'm thinking, okay, I want this to happen in response to this. How do I implement that? Rather than, oh, I'm always going to use a sidechain compressor on that or, or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in Reaper, you know, you can set up sidechaining pretty much from anywhere. You can band split, do phase cancelling setups. You can have effects feeding into other effects. You can have channels actually feeding back on themselves if you want. <laughs> you can make it so that all of a sudden it maxes out the output of your DAW and 
sends Hal around in. And I like that. Yeah. Because, yeah, if I do that, then that was me being stupid. But it means if I want to create, for example, a delay effect where I send the output back to the input to create a feedback loop with a distortion and a chorus and whatever else in line as well, mm. I can do that. Mm. It lets me do it. And then on top of that, you've got the fact that each channel is like 64 streams of audio wide. Yes. So you could mix a whole project in one Reaper channel if you wanted to. Which, again, would be getting yourself into a tangly, horrible mess. It would be idiotic, but the fact that you can do it means that you can do things like set up a band splitting setup in one channel. Mm -hmm. And that then you can do things like the parameter modulation stuff. Like you can get audio from one channel to control an effect parameter on another channel. Yes. So it's like, you know what? Every time the snare hits, I feel that the guitar should be ducked in the high frequencies. I can set up an EQ on the guitar and set its gain control on that little EQ to respond to an audio send that is coming from the snare track. Mm -hmm. Now that stuff is just brilliant because I don't have to think about, oh, can I do this? Will it let me? I can go, I want to do this. I'll do that. And that's so good. And you, you can set up LFOs. Mm -hmm. Here's a good example. You can set up a panner in your channel. You could get parameter modulation to automate that as a kind of a square wave to switch between two channels. Mm -hmm. Then you could put different plugins on those two channels and then sum them to mono. So you could get a like LFO change between two effects. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can do all of that from first principles in a Reaper channel is just brilliant. So it's fun. You can explore. You can play. It's unlimited in that way. Mm -hmm. If there's something I want to do, I can work out a way to do it in Reaper, which has never been the case in any other DAW software. Mm -hmm. And Furthermore, you know, it's got lots of great effects built into it. But if you find an effect that it doesn't do, it gives you the language to code your own plugins in. Now, that's not something I've discovered, really. All the JS plugins yeah. are hand-coded plugins. You can go and look at the script inside Reaper. I did not realise that. You can then go onto the Reaper forum where there are loads of people who are exchanging stuff like this. And you go, you know, I need a plugin that does this. And someone will code it for you, probably. Ha! I wanted a particular switcher set up, for example, that I've used for years, and someone coded it for me. Incredible. I sent him the price of a, of a pint of beer, and he sends me a, <laughs> a plugin that does exactly what I need it to. And this, you see, this links seamlessly onto my third really big reason why I love Reaper, mm. and that is the fact that it is so customizable. It seems like everything but everything you can tweak or hack or whatever. To start with, as a workflow thing, it's the fact that everything that Reaper does, everything, it seems, can be assigned to a keyboard shortcut. Right. And furthermore, you can chain a whole list of things with like dialogue prompts and all this kind of stuff to a single key command. I didn't realise that. For so example, I've got one that takes two mono tracks, pans them hard left and right, and stereo bounces them, so I just am left with a stereo track. And you can do that with a key press now. Yeah, single key press. Or I've got one where if I'm working with like multi-track drums and they're grouped, hmm. I can just hover the mouse cursor above where I want to do an edit, hit a key, it cuts there, and it puts a one millisecond equal power crossfade in. Ha. And if I use a different key command, I've set it up that actually I can use an equal gain crossfade if I think that will work better. Wow. The fact that you can do that kind of stuff means that it's so much quicker for me to work in Reaper than it is in other software. Yeah. And in fact, it goes even deeper than that, the control customization. I don't know whether you've got this bit yet, but everything that the mouse does can be customized too. And this is way beyond most other DAWs. Break that apart for me. So for example, let's say you're hovering over a track and you left click holding the control key Mm. you can decide what Reaper does then and change it. Huh. So, for example, in Reaper, I have all my navigation set up on the scroll wheel with various modify key combinations. So I scroll around up and down, left and right, and zoom in and out entirely from the scroll wheel. Interesting. And it makes it so quick. <laughs> it just means that I often am in people's studios with them and sometimes, you know, like pro engineers and stuff, and I'm sitting behind them at their DAWs and they're trying to do some thing. Yeah. And it just feels like they're wading through treacle <laughs> compared to what I would expect to be able to do in Reaper. So it's just such a speed thing. Right, yeah. And that's only a small part of what is customizable about Reaper. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> like all the menus and all the toolbars can be completely changed and reassigned. Yes, now that I've seen. The bits you have assigned to key commands, you can take out of the menus. Or you can just put the most important things closer up to the top of the menu. Mm. You can completely change the graphical interface. I mean, some people have like made it mimic logic. They've made it mimic Cubase. <laughs> I'm using the old look of Reaper. I'm using Reaper version 5, but I've got the look of version 3 because I prefer it. <laughs> and you can, because Reaper. There's a special programming language called Walter that enables you to completely change all the elements in the GUI and reposition them, resize them, whatever. Really? Actually, my setup is a custom Walter setup where I've got the naming field and the level meter slightly bigger and I've chosen slightly smaller volume and pan controls and adjusted the way they work when you resize the channel. So I mean, what I'm getting from this is that it's been a very useful tool for me, but I am not scratching the surface of what it can do, or, or maybe more to the point, what I can do with it. So my question for you here is, where do you go first in terms of customization? 
Where do you start? That is tricky. And in fact, that's one of the downsides of Reaper. And it's part of its whole model. If they don't work like an ordinary company and that they don't work on a bit of software and come out with a big new update, they constantly update it. There's updates coming out every week or so. It means you don't have to wait for things like bug fixes. Mm. I mean, for example, there's a little uh, checkbox in the gate plugin that inverts the dry signal to turn it into a ducker. Mm. And that's there because I sent them an email and said, you know, if you put an invert thing, it would turn it into a ducker. And it appeared two weeks later. Incredible. But the problem with that is that the documentation can never quite keep up with the features. Oh, interesting. There is documentation for it. In fact, there's a good startup manual that you can use to get to know it in a general sense. Mm. But you have to have a little bit of a DIY ethic to it and get onto the forum. Okay. If you follow some of those people who regularly video blog about it, or vlog, as the cool young kids are saying, <laughs> then I that's a good so. way to keep up with new features. Mm. You have to be a bit proactive about it. You know, you open up Reaper and you get an empty screen. It's not like you automatically have channels and buses and all this kind of stuff. It's just empty. Yeah. And you open a channel and it's nothing. It's just a pan and a volume control and you've got to put something into it. Right. All that stuff you have to do for yourself, that is a downside. Mm. It's like the blank page syndrome when you're, when you're composing. It's like if there's nothing there, you can't do anything with it. I mean, the Reaper community have done their best to try and get around that. They've got like a demonstration project and the documentation thing that they have is pretty comprehensive. So you can kind of get into it in that respect. But yeah, it has a habit of outstripping its documentation because it's constantly changing the whole time. Constantly growing. Another thing that's great about it is the licensing scheme. They treat you like a human. You, you've got, like, I think it's about $60 for a non-commercial license. So if you don't make more than, I think they say more than $20,000 a year from your music, then it's a $60 license. Mm-hmm. If you make more than that, it's a $220 license. It's entirely like an honor-based system. And on top of that, the demo version is completely uncrippled. It's just got an air screen. Mm-hmm. And this means that I can use it without having to worry about dongles and relicensing different machines. Yeah. Because I've paid for it, I can use it where I need to use it. And there's some really, really cool stuff in addition to that. This comes on to my other real point for me specifically that is great about it, is that it's fabulous for educational purposes. You see, I do a lot of training of people. And to do that, I often get them to send me stuff, right. mix it using Reaper and its built-in plugins and everything, send it back to of them. Of course. And even if they're not a Reaper user, they can download the demo. It's Mac and PC, completely uncrippled, and look at all my settings. Right, yeah. Just to underline that, that could be that they are a proud logic user and actually have no interest in changing, but they can still open your project file yep. and see all the plugins. And if they really had difficulty getting around Reaper, then all they would need to do is we open up a Skype session, I look at their screen and go, okay, well, if you click that button, then you'll see where my EQ is. They can mm. ask me questions about it. It's quite easy to walk someone through a session that already exists. Yeah. But the absolute humdinger, educationally, for me, is a feature that a lot of people don't know about Reaper. What you can do with it is you can install it the entire system on a USB key if you want. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. So what it means is that I can install my entire Reaper system with all its customizations, settings and everything. Mm. I can have my plugins in the plugin folder, bring my iLock with me, which authorizes the plugins. I can come into any one studio, which has a PC. I can plug in two USB keys and be working on my system instantly. It's quite something, isn't it? And it is crazy. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It means that I've been able to like do mix workshops. I can walk into a college studio, plug in two USB keys, and I'm away. Reva, thank you so much for the $10 million you gave us <laughs> yeah. for this episode. Yeah, we'd like to thank our sponsors. <laughs> um, my speedboat is lovely. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I should be on commission because I'm such an Angeles for Repub. I mean, basically, I think I just share their ethos about the world. Mm. I don't begrudge paying them money. Mm -hmm. And if their business model works on that, then I'm happy about that. And I will sing on the rooftops about how great it is and do advertising for them. They never advertise anywhere. It's true, you know, I've never seen it. They don't spend (laughs) advertising money. And if you think about that as a user, part of the cost of your software, whatever software you get, is going into marketing. Mm. You're paying for them to advertise to you. (laughs) But you don't do that with Reaper. No. I don't think there's any higher praise that can be offered for it than the fact that we both pay this company money in a way that we don't resent. Yes. I use my phone daily, but I resent Virgin for taking that money from me. Yes. I resent my Wi-Fi payments. But Reaper, it comes around and I go, you help yourself. That's such a good way of characterising it. It's like, good on you. Here you go. Have your money. It's Reaper and strippers for me that just (laughs) inspire that spirit of generosity. Well, obviously, yeah. Only the customisable ones, though. (laughs) We can't end on that. We've had such a wholesome segment. Let's try that again. It's Reaper and Bakeries for me. That's that's fine. And with that, it is time once again to offer our fond farewell to you, our charming, charismatic, handsome listeners. Yes, both of you. (laughs) 
Mum and Dad. Um, Give each other a high five. <laughs> well, we thank our kind sponsors, of course, as well. This month, we are sponsored by Sunkist. You, you will know them, of course, from their, their modern high street tan salons. They're all over the UK and actually Europe now. Household name. They bring the beach to you and... They've recently released a, a new product they think might be of interest to our listeners. Mm. The Sunkist Studio Tan Lamp. <laughs> you know, the advantages. The advantages of this product are myriad and manifold. Yeah, of course, yeah. Take a guess at what the electricity usage is on this bad boy. Well, uh, fractions of a watt. <laughs> it's absolutely nothing. There's no bulb. Incredible, an entirely passive device. An entirely passive device. <laughs> you need only put it close or far away from you in your dark den of a studio your slimy little cave of music Uh, and then just do what you would normally do for that perfect pasty look i wonder whether they need to expand their range to do tell or or maybe they have this do they have special like ceiling cloud ones that are like acoustic treatment (laughs) but they look like a large stone Oh, yes, no, I'm reading it from the press release. So you can officially be under a stone when you're in the studio. I think they have that, and it has all the warmth and homey comfort of a large stone. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, as an audio engineer who spends too much time playing beach volleyball in the summer, I mean, that would be <laughs> top of my list of priorities. Although, to be clear, this is beach volleyball in Germany. The one story I've heard of you to <laughs> beach volleyball is of a mighty school, a tempest, <laughs> whipping up. It's not quite California girl. More like to get wind rash. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Sandburn. Yeah. So a huge thank you to Sunkist, paving the way in making the studio sexy again. And if you also would like to help our efforts with the Project Studio tea breakage, mm. then head over to our Patreon page where we have fresh new nonsense for you every Friday. And there's a corker. There's our news of the Audio World synth watch. Oh, is that up there now? Oh, it is. And we're soon going to be followed by Banksy and Stravinsky's additional body percussion. <laughs> I didn't realise we'd snipped out Stravinsky. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I figured that had to be patrons only. It was too shocking for the public release. <laughs> too, too shocking for the delicate ears of the general public. Yeah, so if you would like to find out what body percussion Stravinsky's been using, <laughs> then uh, become a patron of our site. And thanks again to our newest patron, Tom. Indeed. Stay in touch, as ever. Uh, we are on Twitter at twitter.com slash PSTB tweets. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash PSTB books. And if you're still steam powered like me and only operate on email, then <laughs> try tea break at projectstudioteabreak.com or our website www.projectstudioteabreak.com. I think that might be the first time we've got through all our social media things without messing them up. No, I slightly stuttered the email, I'm afraid. <laughs> Did you? I, I've l- I let the side we're down. We're so close, Mike. We're Sorry. so, so close. That is Project Studio Tea Break. Pro- no, what is our email? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> you always do the email. I've got no idea what our email it's is. It's teabreak at projectstudiotebreak.com. You were just doing that to get me to say it again. <laughs> you know it's too early. Surely not. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. And until next time, ta-ta, pet. Baby, let's go crazy. <laughs> <laughs>